while you're turning to Psalm 127, Hope Darst recorded these lyrics. The song's titled, If the Lord Builds the House. The part of the song, it says, The bricks may be weathered through storm and through fire, but what God holds together will stand firm every time. Because my life is anchored on the solid truth that whatever God is building, no, can't be moved. Because if the Lord builds the house, nobody can tear it down. If the Lord builds the house, nobody can tear it down. When it's built on his name, there's nothing going to shake this ground. If the Lord builds the house, nobody can tear it down. You know, just thinking of those words and we think of King Solomon. King Solomon is, is given credit for penning Psalm 127. But if we think of him as you hear those lyrics, I think that he would fully agree with those lyrics. That if God builds the house, then nobody can tear it down. No, it looks like King Solomon may have been on the mind of the writer of the song. It seems like he, they may have been focusing on just this psalm here in 127. Because King Solomon says in this psalm, unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he gives his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with their enemies at the gate. This is God's holy word. God, we, we come before you today in your presence, and God, we, we praise you for your presence being here today. We praise you, God, for what you have already blessed us with, and we praise you for what you're going to bless us with. God, while hearts are heavy today, God, we can say thank you because you have been faithful. You are a good, good father. And God, because of you, my Jesus has given me access to your holy presence. And God, I can know that when I leave this world, I can live with you forever. So, God, we thank you today. We give you honor. We give you praise. But, God, if there's one here who doesn't know you through your son, Jesus Christ, we ask that he, the Holy Spirit, would just sit down with him or sit down with her and share just how much you love them. God, we pray that whatever's accomplished, you'll be given all glory, that your son will be magnified and not us. This we offer in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Here in Psalm 127, Solomon echoes the message from his book of Ecclesiastes. Throughout Ecclesiastes, Solomon, Ecclesiastes, Solomon stressed the crucial point that life is empty. Life is meaningless without God. To put it in proper perspective, Solomon was indeed the wisest, richest, and the most powerful man of his time. He had everything the world, everything in the world that he could want right there at his fingertips. He had pleasure, he had possessions, he had power. 
But Solomon discovered that having everything that the world has to offer could not bring fulfillment to his life. He realized that being far from God left his life empty and meaningless. So here in 127, Solomon highlights three major priorities that's found in the lives of most men. Building a home or family, we know that you can build a house, but a house isn't a home until the Lord and a family resides there. Protecting the family becomes a priority of most men. And working to provide for the family becomes a priority of most men. And while these priorities that many men should have, Solomon shares that it's all in vain without the Lord. For the most part, men and women today tend to spend most of their time in their adult lives building homes and families, protecting them, providing for them. Yet at the end of the day, many are empty inside. Many marriages are crumbling due to feelings of alienation. And many families feel, uh, fall apart because time is spent making money rather than building memories. Memories that's filled with laughter and joy. Too often everything that they've worked for vanishes away. However, this can be avoided. It can be avoided if we invite Jesus to be the center of our homes and the center of our lives. There are many rewards to Jesus being the center of our homes and our lives and I'm going to focus on just two. And the first is this, that the Lord is the source of your family security. When you center him around, when you're, you center him in your lives and you center him in your home, you'll find out he is the source of security. Because without him there, there is no security. Uh, this psalm, it appears that Solomon is addressing men. However, in today's society, this would, everything that he shares would apply to both men and women. In Solomon's day, it was common for men to take on the responsibility of making sure that their families were secure. Men would build homes for their families. Men would, men would do what they could to protect their families and guard them. And they would work long hours to provide for them. And, and it was good for men to take on that responsibility to make sure their families were secure. But Solomon shares that for men to take on this responsibility without the Lord as their source of security, then they were just wasting their time. Solomon says that they labor in vain. The Hebrew word for vain means empty. It means worthless. It means without result. What Solomon seems to be getting at is that our home should have a firm foundation. It seems he is saying that, ju that just as we build a we build a home with a cornerstone that holds the, the home together. The chief cornerstone should be the one that we're dependent on to hold our families and our lives together. Without him holding us together, our efforts are worthless. Our efforts are empty. Our efforts are in vain. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ, he testifies to this. In Matthew chapter 7, in verses 24 through 27, he, he testifies to us in this passage that as he's closing out the Sermon on the Mount. He gives two illustrations of how we can build our lives in this world. He likens one to a wise man who built his house upon a rock and the other to a foolish man who builds his house upon the sand. He shares with them that storms will come into their lives. Both storms signifying that it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you have. It doesn't matter your position in society. Storms are going to come in your life. Right. You're going to face hardship. You're going to face disappointment. You're going to face grief and pain. But if we are wise and build upon the rock, 
the rock of ages, the rock of our salvation, the rock of the sure foundation that he will hold our lives together, even in moments when we don't know how to breathe. Amen. Folks, make no mistake about it. We should do everything we can to secure our homes and our families. And we don't have much of a problem with that. As a matter of fact, not physically we don't. Because with, with the rise of crime, people are adding the element of security by installing security systems in their homes. Others are putting cameras all around their homes. And others who don't have security systems or cameras, they got a home filled with guns. Somebody should have said amen. amen. I ain't the only one here with a gun. There's too many hunters in here. I know better. There's a lot of concealed weapons in this sanctuary right now. It's concealed weapon permits, that is. Yeah. <laughs> I believe it is wise to protect our home physically, but true wisdom is found when we protect our home spiritually. We must remember that our true security is in the Lord. And when we make him center of our lives and center of our homes, he surrounds us with his hedge of protection. How do we make the Lord the center of our homes and center of our lives? Well, we center our lives around his word. We center our homes around his word. Because if we, we find in his word commands and instructions that are given for our good and for his glory. And if we follow his commands, then what we'll find out is naturally uh, when we obey his word that we're protected from the consequences of living foolishly. Wouldn't that make sense? If I'm following God's word, I'm not going to do something foolish. And therefore, I don't have to follow the consequences of whatever foolish action that I would have committed if I weren't following God's word. And when we've surrendered our lives to the Lord, and we've committed to living by his word, we'll find that we'll not only, we'll not only receive his protection physically but, or naturally, but we'll receive supernatural protection from him. What do you mean, preacher? What well, David said in Psalm 144, 1 through 2, Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle, my loving kindness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and the one in whom I will take refuge who subdues my people under me. What David is doing here, he's crying out to the Lord and he's acknowledging that the Lord is his protector and his provider. And folks, if we truly want to be secure with our families, then we need to make Jesus Christ the center of our homes and our lives. But not only will he give us security will be our source of security, but he'll also be our source of sanct sanctity with our families. Solomon concludes this passage when you look there in verses 3 through 5. He concludes by emphasizing that children are a wonderful gift of the Lord. <laughs> children are a wonderful gift of the Lord. You know what I like about that is Solomon doesn't distinguish he just says children. <laughs> he doesn't say children of believing parents. He says children. He didn't say children of those who are married. He says children. He didn't say children whose skin color looks different than yours. He says children. He says children. <laughs> are a heritage from the Lord. They're a wonderful gift of the Lord. Hard, the hard work of loving parents in building their homes, in protecting their homes, in providing for the family is for their children. <laughs> Boy, every, every mother in here should have shouted right then. Because I know what you do is for your children. You put your husband aside while, their children, while your children are small and then you take care of them and then you get to know your husband a little later once those children get a little older. Is that not right? 
because we're sacrificing everything for those children. Or at least, I know there's a lot of mothers in here who've been good mothers. Yeah, you could testify to this. It's okay. It's okay. In other words, for the sake of our children. Here's what Solomon is saying. For the sake of our children, we must make the Lord the center of our homes. For the sake of our children, I should be serving the Lord. For the sake of our children, I should be bringing mine to church. For the sake of our children, my life should be an example. Nobody's going to follow you like your children. <laughs> Without Jesus in our lives, all our efforts in raising our children are in vain. Our children need a firm foundation that you nor I can provide alone. The world, the world's going to try to tear them apart. <laughs> but when they see Jesus in us, they see some stability. You know, in chapter 10 of the Gospel of Mark, people brought the children to Jesus so that he might touch them. But Jesus' disciples were pushing them away. Jesus' disciples were rebuking the parents. But when Jesus saw it, he was so disappointed that he said to them, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for such is the kingdom of God. Jesus took them up in his arms and he laid his hands on them and he blessed them. I, I, I believe every parent, every parent should be proud of their babies. I, I just believe every parent should love their children and every parent should thank God for their children. Folks, we need to love and we need to appreciate them as the wonderful gifts of the Lord that they are. We also need to realize how imperative it is for us to lead our children to the Lord. The world that we're living in is going to come at them in many ways. Just, just like you, your children will face hardship and they'll face disappointment. They'll face grief and pain and they'll face it and they'll react to it the same way you and I react to it. We can even see in the illustration here that the disciples were trying to keep the children away from Jesus. They were even rebuking their parents for bringing them to Jesus. <laughs> so we can expect even those who profess to be Christians to disappoint us and our children. So for their sake, for their sake... We must invite Jesus to be the center of our homes so that we can teach them how to love people when people are unlovable. So that we can teach them how to extend grace and mercy even when it's not deserved. This can only be done in a home when the home is centered around Jesus Christ. When the lives of the parents are centered or Jesus Christ is the center of their lives. We can't do this on our own. Listen to what the Bible says here. He says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them, for they shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak when their enemies are at the gate. Here we see there in verses 4 and 5 the, the contrast. The contrast here when, when they're young, when children are, uh, of your youth, when, when you're filled with energy and all, they're following behind you and they're wanting to, to be like you. But, and when you get older and you can't really stand up for yourself, <laughs> happy is the man Happy is the man whose quiver is full. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with their enemies at the gate. In other words, listen, the older we get, the more our children are going to defend us. I remember a time when I'd step in front of Taylor and I'd, I'd, get, in her, I'd get in somebody's way so they couldn't get their hands to her. They couldn't hurt her. They could hurt me, but they can't hurt her. But now she'd get in front of me and say, oh, daddy, they're not saying nothing about you. 
That's what your children will do. Many of you have the same testimony with your children where you once took care of that little boy. He'll fight the world for you. For their sake. For their sake. Jesus needs to be the center of the home. He needs to be the center of our lives. The song I opened up with, it has a bridge in it that says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve you, Lord. So here's the keys. Come on in. Everything we have is yours. For if the Lord builds the house, nobody can tear it down. If the Lord builds the house, nobody can tear it down. When it's built on his name, there's nothing going to shake this ground. If the Lord builds the house, nobody can tear it down. Oh, every head bowed, every eye closed. I don't know where your homes are built. But I know if they're built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness, then nobody can tear it down. They may come and they may howl, they may scream, they may set things on fire, but they cannot tear it down. He will, he will be your source of security. And Jesus, you center him in your lives. Build your life around him and his word. He will sanctify you and your house. How do we allow the Lord to build our house? We surrender our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. How do I surrender my life to him, preacher? The Bible says if you believe with your heart, and confess with your mouth you shall be saved if you believe that Jesus is the son of God if you believe he came to this sin cursed world and gave his life for your sin to place a robe of righteousness upon you so you could spend eternity with the father If you believe that if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. And then if you will confess to him that you are a sinner. And you'll trust him for salvation. He'll not only save you, but he'll give you assurance of the salvation. So that you will confess him to this lost and dying world.